And again from here. <gasps> This is a short film that explores what professional dancers can bring to the work of physiotherapists in the world of stroke rehabilitation. Dancers or those involved in movement as their profession use what they call imagery all the time. It's part of the world they live, that, live in, that and the present sense of the body. The art of dance is intimately connected to the idea of image. A dancer presents an image of him or herself in movement. Working with imagery is often central to the development of the dancer's craft. Let's see if you can get those hands moving. And think of your fingers like the, I don't know, the branches on the tree, the twigs, the leaves. And just see if you can get as much movement as you can into your fingers and hands and wrists. Good. And what we're doing here is exploring what dancers mean by imagery. Why is it so important to them? What do they mean by it? And what does this other profession have possibly to learn from it? And follow this music. For Hassan, a canopy of billowing silk could be a metaphorical image for his lungs. Enabled by dancers, he reaches upwards and feels how the impact on his breathing can help him on the road to recovery. The word image for dancers has no single meaning. It could refer to anatomical imagery of the interior of one's own body. OK, so that here, this image is an image of the ribcage seen from above. Suddenly, this gives me space in my body I never visioned before. By giving me that image, I think of my body differently and I can reposition myself, relocate myself in a space that is full of volume and possibility to move. I'm just feeling if my partner is going to go with me. A dancer's anatomical awareness may also lead to imagined images of fantasy anatomies, like wings. It's good to give you the image that you mm. all know that I've... The anatomical image or truth of how the muscle of the wings are, the muscles that make up the trapezius and the latissimus. And from that, if I then add those muscles together and think of those muscles as a wing, and then take it into a... a a move, begin to take it into a movement, movement images, of, images of flying or thoughts of flying, taking it on imaginary journeys, I see that the image of the wing is somehow liberating uh, the, the dancer or the mover from the, the limitation, and I use that very quite, the limitation of just working with the image of the muscle. Many dancers use the imagery of nature for inspiration. So, looking at the trees in the park outdoors, or any tree that might be in your mind that you like, we could think of ourselves as trees and maybe just take a deep breath in and, like branches, reaching up. Enacting the image of a tree not only enables stroke patients to move long atrophied muscles, it makes them feel more positively about themselves and look on the process of recovery more optimistically. Good, good, lovely. And I'm not a practitioner like you. If anything, I'm a teacher, so I'm quite interested in a bit more nuts and boltsy thing. I do want to know what's happening in the brain, particularly, as I said before, when we use metaphor, however one defines that, but something with two meanings at once. A dancer's use of imagery in stroke rehabilitation begs the question of what effect this can have on brain function. Can working with imagery help partially restore stroke-devastated brain regions? For Ilya, the ballooning silk becomes a giant lily leaf, and he becomes a frog, with all the physical potential for leaping that this suggests. Can I tell you what I know this yeah. is? What is it? It's a giant lily. A giant lily? Yes. A giant lily? Oh. And we are uh, a frog. I am oh. a frog on a pond. I want to jump on, the, on the, this white thing. 
which I've never seen before. So I'm interested in the notion of awakening different pathways in the brain at the same time through multi-sensory experience. And movement is inherently multi-sensory. So I walk a long path when suddenly a shower of rain fell upon me and a stone hit my foot on the path. I want to know what's happening when that dual input of touch in this case mm. and words, what's going on there and how do we, you know, and is that resonance going to do something neurologically to, to, to someone? Does that work? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And one doesn't mention the emotional, so it's not just two things going on in different senses, but there's also possibly a resonance of an actual journey or an actual knock mm -hmm. against a stone. So memory, imagination and cerebral activity are all happening at once as I take this walk along the forest path. And, and you, can, you can do all sorts of things. You can say, the leaf of her ear brushed my hand. Image making, in the form of simple drawing, may add a new dimension to the recuperative effects of image-inspired movement. Shall we just try and um, we'll go to the paper and the colours and just see if we can find a shape, a picture, but it might just be a shape or a colour that echoes what we were doing in movement, or maybe just something, whatever you like to do. That's the sense. Mm. talking French Les now. Doigts, eh? Ah, mon Dieu. That's the sea. Mm. And uh, these are like hills in the dunes, mm. in the Sahara. This is the tent. Oh, yeah. find, if you were to find a movement, if you were to find a dance in the picture, where would it begin? Yeah, it's a bit graphic. But where would you begin then? Would it be in the sand dunes? Sand dunes. In the sand dunes. So how would we find a movement for the sand, sand dunes? Lionel's picture of a tent in the desert, perhaps inspired by the memory of some past event, becomes the inspiration for further movement, a hand dance shared by everyone. You have to put the poles up. It'd be better to take one pole. Poles to hold the tent up. Those are fall on our heads. At the moment we stop and listen and s come into a felt sense, we're into a multi-sensory world that opens in many directions. It's more like a prism. The present moment opens in many, there are many windows it opens out through. And that I want to find what matters for a person by opening up that, those, opening them up to their sensory world. Encouraged to draw his lily leaf, Ilya takes his frog story a stage further. That's a pond, a little frog sitting on his, and he's trying to make eyes at Mrs. Frog. We are inviting people to engage at that sensory level, and in the sensory level, new motor, sensory motor, uh, links are, I hope, being made, new pathways being accessed because we've opened up the sensory world and that may key into the motor in different ways. We may find unexplored motor pathways. So that's what's interesting me. I can't stand up right. If, yep, we can help from, you. We'll stand from with this? you. Ilya's frog fantasy motivates him actually to step onto the lily leaf which may or may not bear his weight. Thank you very much. So, we'll move the foot One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm up now. A multisensory fantasy that could be a kind of dance spurs Ilya to risk standing up. Well done, yes. One of the things that happens in the experience of stroke or any neurological illness is there's a narrowing of your your, your experience, you're narrowed down to the problem, narrowed down to the illness. And I suppose the idea, just to come back to the neuroscience again, is that we do have a stored library of movements, of complex movements, and you know, one, it's a slightly hand wavy idea that's been discussed over the last 30 years or so, is whether those 
we just we lose access to those representations and that's part of what we're doing is trying to change something in the brain to, to regain access to those representations. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in whether you think of it that way. And so what I think we're trying to do is to wake up connections into the, the, the wider field of somebody's life which then in turn engages their resources, engages them in all kinds of ways, their own imagination, how they might meet the, the challenges of their experiences. That's one of the things that I think we're trying to do, engaging the whole person through play, which of course has, you know, maybe have flaky connotations, but play is the, f is the first ways that we learn initially. We try it this way, we try it that way. So there's a playfulness, there's a sort of exploratory nature to the movement that we're not, which I don't think that within the medical framework you're allowed to do. If your whole focus is on do it, do it, do it, you become focused on trying to overcome a block. And in play, you find another way around it. It's coming to it through the back door. This is the diet. Oh. Leaf, dying, lily leaf. This is the lily leaf, and we're stepping on it very gently, yes, so we don't doesn't right. sink. Right. Yes. Ah, right. oh. very gentle. Perhaps with the lady frog still in mind, yes. Ilya now steps onto his lily leaf. Wonderful. Okay, so what's and, uh, on it? It's a hugely demanding process that involves reserves of energy and concentration that Ilya may lack. Treading on the leaf very gently, so it doesn't very sink gently, under the, ah, okay, like this. Very gently. And I'm interested in how to get around effort. Can we find, can we stimulate ways of moving that, let go of effort, can we find, can we bypass that, find other ways in, and it's really about getting rid of effort and seeing what, if we can bring about movement one way or another by trick or by hook or by crook. Um, so I'm Nick, um, just reflecting on what you said there just made me think of something I hadn't thought of before. So one, a, a big problem for stroke survivors, fatigue, the, these new ways of moving that people um, have after stroke are there's too much cost in energy terms. So the brain is able to calculate cost. And in some instances, so in, in a, a disease like Parkinson's disease, for example, there's evidence that they can move in a normal way, but it, the cost is just too much. And so they move mm. in an abnormal way mm. because the energy demands for the brain are just too much. And um, whether there are ways around fatigue, for example, which is, which is, really, which is a big problem. Yes. So I hadn't thought of that. Mm. Is that, does that feel right? Yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> what I've noticed uh, in recovery of functional movement is that the very effort often actually interferes with the ability to achieve the task. And my, my experience of working with someone who actually recovered from a big brain injury, a car crash, um, and had relearnt an awful lot of movement, speech, and things was that when she got overexcited, things didn't coordinate emotionally, verbally, and movement wise. So suddenly um, an emotion would be um, out of proportion to the situation. The words that came out of her mouth didn't make sense. It didn't take much in terms of relaxing, often just stopping yeah. action. For there to be, the feeling wise and touch was a big part of that rather than image and suddenly, literally, the words coming out yeah. came out in the right order that made sense. Mm -hmm. You're very small, you're very small down there. Yeah. And done. Thank you, darling. That's brilliant, Ilya. Thank you. The introduction of the aesthetic experience of the dancer into the world of stroke rehabilitation is in its infancy. The story so far seems to show, as in many other areas of health, that the role of the arts in stroke recovery 
and even its place in our understanding of stroke itself may turn out to be far more than an optional extra. Stretch those backs, don't rest now. Um, well done. Thank you. Very well done. Nine. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank